Ball State men's basketball back here on the James Whitford Show. Joel Gadet and the Ball State head coach James Whitford. Uh, busy week for you guys. You went on the road, took the, the long trip to DeKalb, Illinois, took on Northern Illinois. You come back home, uh, doubleheader with Bowling Green on Saturday. And uh, again, it's, it's still a learning process and still a growing process for you guys. One thing we did figure out is you guys can play some offense. Yeah. We, our offense has been good. You know, our defense is the, is the thing that's got to get better. Really, both games, uh, we scored the ball well. And uh, in both games, um, you know, we didn't defend well enough to win. Let's talk about Northern Illinois first. Because we've talked earlier on this show in the season about two-point field goal percentage and mm -hmm. not being where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. You include Northern, that game and the three games prior, 61%. You guys made your first nine twos. You didn't yeah. miss in the first half. Yeah. It's kind of where you want to be. It is. You know, we're, we're trying to play inside out. I thought we shot a few too many threes against Northern Illinois, but, uh, you know, we're, we're good inside, in particular with the emergence of Franco House. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's leading the conference in field goal percentage and uh, is doing a great job and is creating shots for both him and other people. He's also second amongst forwards in the Mid-American Conference in assists or an assist rate. So he's a guy that doesn't just do it for him, right. but does it for other people as well. Let's start off early. It wasn't Franco House that uh, had the good offense in the early going. It was Bo Calhoun on the interior. And there we see some of his stretch game going in the, the 15 to 17 foot range. Yeah, Bo's, uh, Bo's much improved as a shooter, really improved since last year, and he's helping us a lot on the offensive end. And then Jeremiah Davis, who had been in a funk offensively, has kind of brought his way out of that. Uh, JD with the jumper to get it to a 9-6 game. Then Sean Sellers, the three-pointer, off the paint touch, which is big. That's what we talk about is, is those threes. Here's another one where a ball gets inside, and although Franco shoots that one, if he chooses to pass, he's going to get someone a great shot. And, uh, as long as we get it in there, we're, we're getting good looks. Here's another one getting it inside. Bo Calhoun, the kick out, the one more. That's perfect offense. It is, and we're doing a good job. You know, I'm, I'm pleased with where we are in the offensive end. We really have a share of the ball mentality. We have seven players who have scored in double figures in conference this year. Darrell Bowie forgets the basketball on that drive, cards with the steal, and take advantage the other way. Again, paint touch, although it's high, then you give it into Franco. Yeah. Full head of steam lays it up. Yeah, great basket, and as you can see, the quality of the shots we're getting. We're not hitting tough shots. We're getting the ball into the paint. Jeremiah Davis, 5'6 footer, getting uh, really good looks at the basket. Northern Illinois had its share, though, and in transition, it's Trayvon Baker. Buries the three. He was four of six from deep on the game. Cardinals lead cut to just two there. 90 seconds left to go in the half. Xavier Turner, the pass to Aaron Armstead. He goes coast to coast, lays it in. Northern Illinois takes the lead there and uh, nine steals in the game for NIU. We go to the halftime break, though, and toward the second half, Cardinals came out again pretty well on offense. Francis Giappe has been red hot from three. Yeah, and I couldn't be happier. You know, it's, he had missed a lot of time in the summer and in the fall, and it uh, took him a while to get his rhythm, but boy, is he playing good basketball. Don't dare Bo. Too much <laughs> space. Yeah, Bo, Bo, that's a good shot for Bo. We run that play, you know, in case they don't guard him. Xavier made the right read and hit him for a three. I watched this play three times, trying to figure out who was supposed to guard Rocco. I couldn't figure it out. You had him in rotation? Yeah, we did. And then that's uh, when we play Rocco and Bo at the four and the five, we're small. So we try to move those guys out to the perimeter and, uh, and it loosens them up to get shots. That was the last lead for the Cardinals, though. Michael Orris, who had hit one three all season, knocks down two for Northern Illinois. Then Eric Armstead, who's really twitchy, gets inside. Marin Marich, their redshirt freshman big man, with the putback, the celebration. Cardinals uh, kept trying to push it though on the other side and you actually get within four here, mm -hmm. but Northern Illinois an 8-0 run over the final two minutes after you guys had an 8-2 run. And again, it came down to, to not being able to get stops. Yeah, you know, we had our, I think this was our, uh, what was it our sixth road game? And I believe in all six road games, we had second half leads, including this one. There's another inside out basket the way we want to play. And, uh, but you know we're, we're a little undersized, we're a little bit worn down as we're only playing seven, but nonetheless uh, we have to defend better and uh, we will here down the stretch. 75-63 the final score in that one and we didn't even talk about him, we didn't see him in the highlights, but Jordan Treloff I think was case in point there. Their big man mm -hmm. goes six of seven, limited his catches because he only took the seven shots, but he right. was six of seven. It was really the difference in the game because they started out to start the game. I think he got three of their first four touches and really forced us to collapse inside quite a bit to try to contain him. And as we did, it opened up things for other people. You bounce off of that. You've <clears> now <throat> seen everybody in the conference. Mm -hmm. And I, I told you uh, before the game, I go, I, I think that's kind of, that's got to be an anomaly. You've played mm -hmm. everybody once, nobody twice. Uh, how do you feel about the lay <clears throat> of the league? Well, the league is terrific. Yeah, it's just not my opinion. It's it's uh you know that it's you, a fact. It's a fact. You look at the numbers. It's the best the conference has been in 15 years, and um, and it's the strength of our league is <clears throat> is the depth of it. 
You know, the Missouri Valley has two elite teams, and three through ten, they're not near as strong. Uh, our conference, one through twelve, is very, very good. Let's take a look at uh, the team you played second first, mm -hmm. and that was Bowling Green on Saturday. And I, I think we figured out that of, of the league being very good, they are kind of surprisingly the, the cream of the crop of that. Chris Jans has done a nice job in year one. He has done a really good job. He's a really good coach. He's, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's inherited a lot of veterans and nonetheless was able to change styles and get them to play very disciplined basketball. They take care of the basketball. They're fundamentally sound on the defensive end. And, and uh, probably as much as anyone in our, team, in our league, they don't beat themselves. If you're going to beat them, you've got you to gotta play a very good game. When we played Buffalo, you talked about Justin Moss potentially as a player of the year candidate mm -hmm. in the MAC. Would you like to change your vote? Ah, well, I, I think they're both there. You know, you know, Rashawn Holmes is a much better defender than Justin Moss. Justin Moss is probably the offensive player of the year in the conference. Rashawn Holmes is the defensive player of the year uh, and one of the best defensive players that's come through this conference in my 15 years. I mean, he's just, he's an elite defender. Rashawn Holmes in this game, 20 points, seven rebounds, four assists, three blocks, one steal, no turnovers. It was a heck of a day for Rashawn Holmes. Bowling Green gets out to a 5-0 lead early. You guys had some punch back, though, in the early going. Sean Sellers, the three, makes it a 5-3 game. That was Sean's only bucket of the ball game, though. He finished uh, one for five from downtown. Jeremiah Davis, though, we talked about him finding a groove offensively. He continues that, and again, drive and kick. You get the paint touch, you get an mm -hmm. open three. Yeah, Jeremiah's getting more comfortable. He's a little bit like Francis, had missed a lot of time, and, and you know, basketball's a rhythm game, but he's, he's getting more and more comfortable with each day. Rocco Belcaster, 83% of his shots are from three. Took one step inside the arc, yeah. they sagged off him. He knocks down the 19-footer. On the other side, it's uh, Henderson knocking down the three with the foul on a tough one for Jeremiah Davis. He converts that, so 18-13, and then you see the athleticism there. Rashawn Holmes is a big guy, and he runs the floor. Yeah, he really runs the floor and, and um, is, is dynamic and scored every place on the floor on offense. Again, more great ball movement. Francis Kiapwe, the three. Team high 16 points for Kiapwe. And then it's Xavier Turner and Franco House. Little two-man inside the paint. And there's some speed and athleticism, and Spencer Parker just couldn't guard him. Yeah, Franco's doing a great job. Man. He's, he's, to me, he's making a real strong case to be an all-conference player as just a sophomore and is uh, such and so improved from a year ago. Cardinals down four after Jeremiah Davis buries the three with the, the mean face to boot on top of that. And then we talked about the contested three, mm. Javon Clark. Not a whole lot Francis could do there. That's a player making a play. And mm. it goes from being at one point, you know, four points with a couple of minutes left to 11 at the half. It was a big stretch. You know, we missed back-to-back -back front ends. They made two free throws on a bonus and then hit that three in a four-point game, went to 11. I thought it, it uh, really took the wind out of our sails. And it ballooned early on here in the second half as well. Cardinals still had some fight back, though, as the lead kind of jumps here to 13, 14, 15 points. Bo Calhoun, the layup and the timeout, now 18 points as Bowling Green's advantage six minutes in. But still, Spencer Parker having a tough time with Franco House, and it kind of gives you hope for what Franco can become here. Yeah, he's, he's, he's already a really good player. Leads the conference for field goal percentage, averaging around 13, I think, in conference play and uh, has a, such a bright future for us. Xavier Turner, 12 points. He was four of seven. He can shoot the three, but so can Rashawn Holmes. He made three 20-footers, he said. Two of them were three. Yeah, he, he uh, you know, one of our goals was to try to turn him into a jump shooter, and, and unfortunately for us, he made him. But that's certainly the lesser of two evils for him. Zach Denny is a jump shooter. Uh, he knocks down the three. 24 points is the largest lead for Bowling Green. You guys go on a 12-0 run here, though. Chris Jans put the reserves in, and maybe a little early because it became a ball game. You got it down mm -hmm. to 10, and he sent all the starters back in. And uh, you were able to capitalize. The guys didn't have quit, and they, they kept playing basketball. Yeah, we actually had a chance to cut it down to eight there. Jeremiah had a breakaway where he bobbled the pass and uh, had a chance to make it a game. But nonetheless, uh, credit to Bowling Green. They played a great game. They returned the three there as that finishes things off. 72. 58 the final score in this one. Bowling Green is now solely in first place, by the way, in the MAC East. Akron lost this weekend. So Bowling Green, after going 12 and 20 last year at 17 and 6, is, uh, is number one in the MAC East and I think would be the number two seed behind Toledo if the MAC tournament started today. Francis Kiapwe, of course, we talked about how well he's come on here and it's huge for him because of the, he had that kind of funk in January, that little slump, and then to pull back out of it, 60% from three, the yeah. last eight games for Francis. Yeah, he, he, uh, he's playing great basketball, and it's a little bit like I said, you know, he, we, he, he got had surgery in May, yeah. missed all the way really through almost November, and um, 
didn't play in our first two games, was still rehabbing. So it takes time for a guy that's missed that much time, and I think he's he's caught his rhythm now, and is is uh, you're seeing the player that that we certainly thought he could be. And part of it is what it is when you look at the statistics. Uh, Bowling Green played 14 guys. Mm -hmm. They had more guys score than you guys played. Yeah. And part of it's just depth and yeah. kind of the, the way things work right now. But you got a lot of guys in track suits, and it kind of gives you hope on what can come. Yeah, you know, we're, not, we're certainly not where we want to be. And you know, that's something we have to embrace and accept. And you know, we have to get better on the defensive end. We know that, and uh, we're working hard to do it. But there's a really bright future for, our, for all of our guys. You know, we have Jeremy Tyler sitting out. He was our second leading scorer. You got Ryan Weber, who through practice is any given day can be our best player and is uh, a terrific player. Rashawn Richardson, red shirting, somebody who will give us real important size inside. And uh, two really good freshmen coming in. And you know what? We're going to return everybody that you're seeing in this game, every single player, because Cammie's not playing, is going to be back not only for one year, but really majority of them for back-to-back for -back years. So I'm confident we have a lot to build with. We just have to, to make sure we're improving on the defensive end daily. You touched on two of the guys that have done really well as of late. It's the two post players for the Cardinals who are having to really step things up without Matt Kamenicki. You've got Franco House at six foot six playing in the post, and Bo Calhoun at six foot five playing in the post. And offensively, at least, check out these numbers. Franco House in conference, 13 points per game, five and a half rebounds, second highest. We said this assist rate of any Mac forward. Only Connor, uh, only, only Connor Tavy at Western Michigan has a higher assist rate. Bo Calhoun, nine points and eight rebounds a game in conference. You put them together in league play, they average 21.8 points per game total. That is the fifth highest for any two post players of any Mac school. The only ones better, Bowling Green, we just saw Rashawn Holmes, mm -hmm. Buffalo with Justin Moss, we talked about him, Ohio, who's got Maurice Nador, and Toledo, who's got Nathan Booth. You're mm -hmm. talking about four veteran teams with four veteran players and then you lead to Franco and Bo Calhoun. Two post players who've done a lot of work to get themselves better. Sat down with both of them and their coach, Brian Thornton, to talk about their uh, advancements here this season. Check a Ball State basketball box score recently. One thing's for sure. Bo Calhoun and Franco House filled the thing up. In Mac play, House leads the cards in scoring with a smattering of a lot of everything else mixed in. It's not just the points that he scores, it's the attention that he demands. Um, he's become a guy that we throw the ball to, you know, almost every possession down the floor at some point, and he's almost a point forward in some respects from a post position. And Bo Calhoun in conference nearly averages a double-double. Rebounding is the thing that he does best. I think he's done that, you know, over the course of his career. Uh, last year, even when he was playing very limited minutes, his rebounds per minute were still extremely high. This has a knack for the ball. If he gets his hands on it, he finds a way to come up with it. It's all the more impressive because last year, House scored six points a game, shot 44%. And Bo was ninth on the team in minutes played. For me, the main thing was my mindset and like just coming in the game aggressive, like coming in knowing like I got to take over, I got to do this. I just got better just just off my hard work, you know, just improving. The key words. The reason that they've gotten so much better is they're every single day guys. You know, they, they might be two guys that I've enjoyed coaching the most in my career so far because every single day they crave the opportunity to get better. Which takes hard work, like Bo's thousands of shots over the summer. The most I ever shot today was like 2,000. Like I'll come in, like shoot like 750, 750. Well, you know, I'm missing like hook shots, you know, floaters and stuff too. And Franco's dedication to being diversified. I got more moves than I have ever had in my life. I mean, in high school, I just dribbled past people. And, and you know, another thing that's been impressive about the Cardinals' growth in the front court is that they're doing it feeling a little bit undersized. It's hard, but once I'm playing, my, uh, my uncle always told me. Man, as long as you're on the court, make it work. So, like, I don't complain. I don't know if I'm on the court making it work. But, like, you can see a difference, but I'm not going to, like, be scared. The hardest uh, people I play against are probably those six, six, nine, six, ten people that are just huge, and it's hard to move and get where you want to be. The MAC is filled and has always been filled with undersized guys, whether it be Antonio Gates or Anthony Stacy, guys who are a little bit undersized, stronger built guys who have the ability to get a lot done in the post. So to their credit, both have found multiple ways to be impactful. Franco's not just a scorer, he has the second highest assist rate of any big man in the Met. I've always been an unselfish player, I would say, growing up. 
I've never been the type of person who has to go out and score 30 points or take at a numerous amount of shots. I, I try to be patient. I try to let the game come to me, and if my teammates are hot, I'll lay back and I'll just I'll distribute. And Bo can really shoot. You know what? If you're a 6'5 center, you better find some other ways to score. And what he's done is he's made himself into a three-point shooter. He's in one drill we were doing. I just started shooting threes. I was making it. And he was like, I'm going to talk to the coach about you shooting threes. Oh, I was happy. You know, I was like, man, about time. Yeah, his time all right. Bo's time. Yeah, <laughs> he's right. It's a true story. You know, he became a great mid-range shooter, and then uh, we just stepped him back a few feet, and he was shooting it well. And but I'm really proud of both those guys because you know we had uh, four players return from last season's team, and uh, Rocco, Bo, and Franco, all three of them, have made huge steps forward from where they were a year ago to where they are this year, and that's what we want our program to be about. And and uh, when guys come back in the off season, they work their tail off, and you know next year we'll have a chance to return. You know. 11 guys and we have to see that same jump that those three had really with the entire 11. For the record, Brian Thornton uh, played in the SEC, started at Vanderbilt, then played at Xavier, uh, pretty good, six foot eight. We saw the battle of the boards signed behind him from uh, Cincinnati, he and Eric Hicks. Um, he likes to get into practice and kind of bang with them in workouts still. Mm -hmm. Bo and Franco both said they could beat him one-on-one. -on -one. So we have to set that up. Uh, well, I have to see it to believe it, but um, <laughs> Brian's certainly not in the shape that he, that he once was, but, uh, but I think I still have to see that to believe it. Let's talk about uh, some history in, in post players, too, for this program. Uh, our second edition of Cardinal Flashback, and I don't want to say post because he's not a post player, but Dennis Trammell was a pretty big guy and a guy who's still very much around this program uh, here today, somebody who back in the early 2000s had some really good years for Ball State. Let's take a look at our second Cardinal Flashback. Our first was Petey Jackson, our second... Dennis Trammell. As Trammell knocks down the fadeaway, big basket there by Dennis Trammell. We had some great, some great runs. I mean, some great wins. Beat some teams that you know people didn't expect us to beat. Tim Buckley congratulates Thad Mata. Maybe the other way around. I don't think Coach Mott is very happy right now, I'll tell you that. Owens leads the way with 23. Ball State gets it done. You know, Xavier coming in, you know, everybody, like I said, nobody really expected us to beat them. We had big assignments, not only on the defensive end, but we had big assignments, you know, putting the ball in the basket, too. Trammell working on Cage. And he's starting to light it up. I felt like we were well prepared <laughs> for them and what they had. Trammell from the corner. They are our defense is what really took us over uh, in the end. They, I think Xavier really struggled, um, especially their two main guys. They struggled to really score on myself and, and Matt McCullum. All tied at 42, 19 for Owen. Steele McCullum going the other way. Sato on him, won't let him go. You go in the game, feel like the, the cards are stacked against you a little bit, and you know, and. Um, you know, you're the underdog, and you know when you come out on top, you know that, I think that really builds camaraderie within your teammates, and and we felt we felt great. All right, Dennis, what a win! What a great win by the Cardinals. Western Michigan, man, that was same thing. You know, 50, 60 game home win streak that they had at the time. Uh, had great players. The one I remember in particular was Ben Reed, hands down one of the best players in the conference at the time, and uh, was beating everybody. Um, and I matched up with him at home. Tramel checks the clock and fires. We were maybe up one or two or something like that, and they had the ball last, and we needed to get a stop, and we got it. Shot clock at 10 as Tramel kicks to Stovall. We competed, you know, whether that was uh, when we had our individual sessions, making more shots <laughs> than the next person, or whether that was open gym, you know, winning the most games. Um, getting a stop here, getting a stop. I mean, we competed. Tramel is open. Three pointer. That's exactly what they needed, Vince, to have something positive happen. We were silly. We had fun together. You know, we laughed together a lot. I mean, still to this day, we can we can send each other a text message that's like three words long, and I'm I'm I will literally laugh out loud. You know, <laughs> you know, because it just takes us back to that time. Ball State headed up by. Tim Buckley in his fifth year at the helm of the Cardinals program. You see. I had very, very great experiences. Started and stopped with my coach, Tim Buckley. He knew how to teach it. He knew how to motivate you. He knew how to encourage you. 
he knew how to get us over that hump. Whatever it, whatever it was, I got better. You know, I got so much better when I was him at, here at Ball State as a basketball player. That's what you want. You know, every player that comes into college wishes and hopes for that. I don't care if you was the first man out on the court in the starting five or the last player on the bench, you got better. I mean, and not just a little bit better. I've never bought a Ball State shirt until this year. It just goes to show like, you know, when you're connected and you feel connected to a program, you know, you're, you know, you go all out and, and sub, to, to do what you can to support him. And now that, that Wifford is here, I mean, he reaches out to me, you know. He wants me, and not just me, but all the other alum to be a part of, of the program. And he's also here at the YMCA a lot, you know, where I work at, and just having that connection, you know, with, with the program again, is really what's helped me get back into, you know, being, um, I guess, a fan. A lot to bite off there, but, you know, you look back, and I, I remember your introductory press conference, Dennis Trammell, I think, was one of the only fans that asked a question, and he talked about uh, player development and how big mm -hmm. that was, and he talks about, hey, when I was a player, yeah. we got better. Yeah. And, you know, we turned the cameras off there, and he said, the thing I like most about what's going on right now is that you look at guys, they're getting better. Yeah, it, that's what our program is based on and, and, uh, and needs to be, and that, that, you know, it takes time for it to really pay dividends, but that's critical. And other thing I want to say in talking about this piece is, uh, you know, what an impressive guy Dennis is. You know, I see him work at the YMCA, and, and uh, you know, I got my kids there. You know, I'm heavily invested as a father, and it's one of the best programs uh, I've seen for young kids. And it's, uh, he's really inspirational, and he touches a lot of lives. And it's a great, great example of someone as a student athlete who really developed, he grew, he gives back, somebody the entire program should be proud of. And he talks about some games, too, that when you mm -hmm. look back on, that's where you want to get this program. Get Xavier yeah. in here and beat him. No, I watched, I watched that game. I still remember it. I'll never forget uh, watching it because I, I knew Thad and Sean really well. I was coaching at Miami of Ohio in the same conference, and uh, I watched that game, and it was a great win by Ball State, and it was great to see the energy in the gym, and that's certainly where we're, we're trying to get it back to. Let's talk about uh, the baby steps to do just that. Uh, next game up for you guys is Kent State. Mm -hmm. um, it's a team that you guys have played once. You're going there now. They may or may not look different, uh, Jimmy Hall has mono, mm -hmm. uh, he may or may not play. Mm -hmm. How much does that change things? Well, it changes things a lot because, uh, you know, we'll see if he plays or not. I know it, this is right around the time he's supposed to get back, but if he's in the game, you know, you have, you have real no choice but to double the post. And, uh, and if he doesn't, if he's not in the game, they're predominantly a pick and roll team or a team that really relies on their guards to score, create action. And it's a very different way of playing. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. But because we know he could be back, we certainly have to be prepared for both. Let's take a look at the Golden Flashes right now, who are at the top of the MAC East. Not the team at the top, but one of the, the grouping at the top of the East right now. Tied with Akron, uh, their losses, Bowling Green, Buffalo, Western Michigan, Akron, they have lost three of their last five, but again, Jimmy Hall, who you see there, um, is out with mononucleosis. So they've got Ortiz, Spicer, and Lawrence, who did struggle in their loss to Toledo, three of 14 from the field, but uh, one heck of a game. You take their leading scorer out, they still win in overtime on the road on yeah. national television. No, it was a great game, and I watched the game. Their guards played terrific. Chris Brewer, Derek Jackson uh, took over the game down the stretch, made big shots. And did it with some adversity. They were up five with 30 seconds left. It's yeah. easy to fold. Yeah, no, they did. It was a great, great win for them, and, and uh, it's what they, that offense say. You know, think about Kent. They're good on offense, but they're great on defense, and defense travels, and... Uh, and they were able to contain Toledo's offense and score enough points to win. 63-52 was the score the first time these teams met back on January 24th. We mentioned Jimmy Hall had 32 points. You guys shot it well enough, 43%. Um, did have the 16 turnovers, though, which right. hurt you. Uh, you and Rob Sendroff are very close, yeah. uh, and, and he had a tough season last year. Um, yeah. Have you talked about the, the turnaround that he's been able to go through? Um, we, we, yeah, I talk to him all the time, but I, I what do you talk, talk about? <laughs> what I, I else do you talk about? We don't share. We don't share. Talk, talk about our own teams in season, but uh, but you know we were a different team in January because one of the things that's changed for us is Franco's really emerged and uh, and is playing great basketball. But but you can see they hurt us with Jimmy Hall right there, and uh, we we actually have it was our worst offensive game of the conference against them, and uh, we have to do better. On that end, and hopefully uh, without Jimmy Hall, they're not as dangerous inside. What changes second time around? You see a team, they've seen you. 
how do you adjust? Uh, you know, at this point in the year, there's enough film that teams know you well enough. Mm -hmm. it, are there just generic ways that you change second time around? Well, it changes a lot because you know the first time through, you get to see what each team did against you. You know, the way they trapped us in the post, they got to see the way we handle the post trap, and you're both making decisions on on uh, what worked, what ways you want to tweak. Your players know each other much better. You've been through one game plan, so you're you're really able to be more detailed. And uh, it's really more, you can make more tactical decisions when you've seen someone a second time. And the scouting report sinks in a little bit because yeah, I know much, that guy. Yeah, you know the first part, so you can, you, can get, you can get it really into a second, deeper layer from a scouting standpoint. All right, wait, good luck this week. All right, thanks, Joel. It's Kent State on Wednesday, Central Michigan on the road Saturday. We'll be back here next week to break them both down. It's the James Whitford Show here on the Ball State Sports Network. See you next week.